Okay, I think we're live. It looks like we're live. I'll just wait to hear from Dan backstage. Yeah, we're live. Great. So I will just wait a few minutes to let people join before I introduce myself and begin the talk. We're just checking that everything is live on um, both platforms that we're streaming this on. Bear with, with us for a couple of minutes. Dan, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Please let me know when I should start. So, yeah, okay, you can hear me, great. Just let me know when I should start. We are good. Okay, great. So, hi everyone. My name is Dina. I am one of the co-founders of Second Tree. We are a um, grassroots NGO that works in, um, in the Epirus region of Northern Greece, where we deliver educational and integration opportunities for both refugees and locals, um, children and adults. As well as being the co-founder, I'm also um, managing the media and policy teams. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. Thanks, a big thanks to Bristol Refugee Week for inviting us to share our experience with you. Um, so we've been working in the refugee response for the last four years. And over, um, over that time frame, we've developed a community engagement model that um, I'll be basically talking you through. Hopefully the talk will give you some food for thought and some ideas um, on how to better engage with the people who um, are behind the refugee label. So I'd like to begin with a quote, um, a quote by a writer who herself was a refugee. I think this quote 
quite profoundly captures um, a mistake that we often make when we speak about refugees. She says, in the eyes of many, Auschwitz is a point of origin for survivors. People who want to say something important about me announce that I've been in Auschwitz. But whatever you may think, I don't hail from Auschwitz. I come from Vienna. Vienna is a part of me. That's where I acquired consciousness and acquired language. But Auschwitz was as foreign to me as the moon. Auschwitz was merely a gruesome accident. So if a refugee doesn't identify with these circumstances, why do we define them by it? It seems unfair. It seems really unfair. I wouldn't want to be defined by circumstances that happened to me by complete accident. No one is merely a refugee, after all. Being a refugee is a legal status, not a character trait. For some reason, we frame it that way. In Europe today, being a refugee is depicted in one of three ways. Being a hero, someone who can do no wrong. Being a victim, someone who needs our help. Or being an invader, someone who threatens our way of life. But these depictions were created by us because being a refugee is as far into refugees as it would be to you. Um, it's important to give this some thought because these depictions really influence us. They got me to act. Um, it was the summer of 2015, I think, when I saw a Daily Mail article that depicted or that was showing pictures of people washing up on the shores of Kos with a headline saying the British tourists were angry that their holidays were being ruined. This portrayal was disgusting. It, it really made me ashamed to be European in that moment. I mean, these people were clearly in need of our help. They were fleeing wars that we were condemning from the safety of our screens. They were, um, they were, being, they were escaping governments who had failed or worse, turned on them. And when they came to us for help, we saw nothing but burdens. It was this article uh, that got me to go to Greece in the first place. I really didn't want these depictions to represent me. So I took two weeks off work. Um, I was working Qatar Foundation at the time. And I, I went to Greece. I found a camp, Camp Katsikas, on Facebook. Actually, the majority of the refugee response, um, the volunteer-led refugee response, was organized through Facebook. It was quite incredible. So I, I decided to go. And I remember really clearly the feeling I had when I was driving up to the camp in the first place. I was, I was really nervous. Um, I guess I was nervous at what I would find there. It, in, like deep down inside, I really felt like the media was painting a worse picture than, than it actually was because I just couldn't stomach the fact that Europe could treat refugees in the way that they were. And I remember driving up to the camp and unfortunately I was wrong. I was wrong to think that the depiction was, um, wasn't reality. What I saw there was, was horrible. It was undignified. I remember a, a friend of mine at the time saying or asking if Greece was really in Europe because in Syria animals wouldn't be allowed to live like this. And I suppose that I was on, on, on that I was wrong in the sense that our politicians, we did have human rights standards and we do have conventions in place that should um, not allow this to happen, but our politicians had double standards. And that was clear from, from the situation on the ground there. But on the other hand, I, I, I wasn't wrong in the sense that what I found when I got there were regular people like me who rejected these double standards and who came with the same idea. They came to help. They came to stand in solidarity with the thousands of people who had been abandoned there and to represent the values that our politicians had failed on. But they also came with the same degree of naivety. We all wanted to help. We just didn't know where to start. The need seemed huge. So we decided to, well, we none of us had any experience organizing a camp and we 
sort of looked around and figured out people's skills and yeah, decided on roles based on that. So I had taught English before. My background is in education. So I became the teacher. Um, we, I mean, if anyone who's watching has been in a camp before, you'll know the tireless energy um, of the kids there. And you'll know how little or actually nothing there was for them to do. So we turned this massive um, tent into a school. It had four benches for about 40 kids. And although it may look quite calm in this photo, uh, the situation was uh, chaotic. The trauma was, was palpable, you could feel it. Every activity started with tears. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, at the beginning, the camp, wasn't a community at all. I mean, these this was a thousand people who were dropped in this old military airport um, with nothing, nothing for them there. There was tents with floorless tents with um, just a bed of rocks to sleep on and no electricity, no running water, no sewage system. Mm -hmm. It seemed really unfair that victims of war were now victims of a really dehumanizing asylum process. And it felt like we, the volunteers, had to make up for that, to show them that Europe had compassion. So when a child cried, when a woman begged, when a man screamed, we reacted with tolerance. We appeased it. And it was hard and it was emotionally draining, but we kept putting our feelings to the side because it felt like they were less important and the needs of the people we were, we were working with um, were a lot more urgent. And <laughs> for the first few weeks there, every day started with shit. And I don't mean that metaphorically, literal human feces. See, the tent that we endearingly called our school was used as a toilet um, overnight. Um, there were only four proper toilets in the whole camp. So, and they were those festival style toilets that didn't get cleaned. So you could imagine the state of them. Uh, we didn't blame people for, for, doing, um, for using the school as a toilet. In fact, we, you know, we, we empathized with it. Um, we we thought that if we were in their place, we would probably be doing the same thing. But the task was degrading and it really wore us down. And after some time, we also began asking ourselves, why are we tolerating this? No one's okay with this. Um, and by choosing an action, by choosing not to say something, we were, we were making a choice. Um, but I suppose, there was a lot of guilt at the time. We felt super guilty about the conditions that the people were living in. And we wanted to sort of be a positive contribution to this otherwise dire situation. And it felt like any kind of confrontation, any kind of disagreement would, yeah, would, would impact people, would trigger people for want of a better word. But again, by not addressing it, we were okaying it. And it wasn't okay for anyone. Um, we knew this because we spent a lot of time with people um, outside of the classes, in the evenings, that was all dedicated to getting to know people. And so while our day may have started with cleaning shit, it always, and with a lot of frustration, it always ended up with laughter in people's tents until the early hours, playing Uno, drinking copious amounts of chai, um, seeing pictures of, of their past lives and hearing stories of who they were before this moment. And in this, in these moments, it was very clear that people really didn't want to be seen through the lens of this horrendous situation. They didn't want to be defined by it. And it was in these moments um, that we, that I realized I was seeing refugees through a lens that was damaging. I was seeing them as victims. And by seeing their actions through that lens, we were assuming that their suffering had somehow made them incapable of having a conversation. This wasn't fair either. 
they weren't passive they weren't passive victims they the camp was dehumanizing and the conditions were terrible and this does this could depress you but it could also force you to act and uh, many people saw the effort the tireless effort that we were putting in to make the best out of a terrible situation and they began they began to get involved themselves the the best sort of way that this could be illustrated, I think, um, is through the story of the school. So as I said, um, the school was being used as a toilet overnight, and we were at breaking point. Um, we had spoken a lot to our students about this. They had seen us, they had seen how our day starts, they had seen us cleaning, and but nothing changed. Um, so we basically said, okay, clearly, people need a toilet more than a school, and this tent can't be both, so we'll just stop our activities. And so we did, and obviously none of us were happy about it, but, you know, a choice had to be made. And a few days went by when a young Syrian man came over to us and started talking about how, what a shame it was that the school closed, how children had been out of school for the last five years, and how it was really, really needed. He asked for our help. He asked us to start it up again. We said, we'd actually never met him before. His name is Faraz. He probably had never left his tent up until that moment. So we explained to him the situation. We said, look, we, we had a school. We, this has been happening in it. And we, got, we received a message from the community, at least symbolically, that a toilet was more necessary. So he said, okay, I will convince them that a community school is needed. He said he'd go tent, to tent, tent by tent if he had to. So a few days went by and um, Faraz came back. And not only had he managed to convince the community that a school was needed, he also managed to put together a construction team. I think there should be a photo up. Yeah, there they are. So on the far, this is the team outside the school. On the far left, I think, is Noor, then Kafri, Faraz, Bassam, and Allah. The, and that behind them is the school that they built. I think there's, there should be another photo of the school coming up. Yeah, so here's Allah outside, uh, sorry, no, it's Noor, out on the table. Uh, doing some final touches, and you see behind him the, the community school that they built. There's four classrooms and even a, a little teacher's room in the back there. And this action really transformed the camp. It turned a, it turned a thousand strangers into a community that worked together to make the, the place a little bit better than it was. And the construction team didn't stop there. They built benches, a prayer, a prayer tent, a gym, um, a tea tent, and they even built a replica of the Homs clock tower with the clock symbolically reading the time when they first arrived in Kamkatsikas. Well, yep, that's the one. There's the Homs clock tower, and this is right outside the school. So it took the loss of something good our classes, our activities, to get to put people into action. And these interactions really kept reminding us to check our biases. You know, the assumptions you have about people, both good and bad, influence how you interact with them. So one really important lesson that we learned, um, which yeah might seem obvious now, is not to expect people to act or think a certain way based on their nationality, gender, or background. A common bias that people, um, another common bias that people uh, have is not wanting to challenge the demands of refugees because they've seen or been through so much. Uh, here's an example that I'll share with you of the first time we were confronted with this in a new camp. So we had, um, it was 2017, I think, and we had just started working in a camp, in a new camp, um, where the people had just been moved from, from Lesbos. So it was mainly 
um, Afghans and Syrians. And we were new, they were new. Um, we had just sort of begun our, our language classes there. We had lots of signups. Um, we were super excited about, about starting. And I remember it was one of the first classes, or maybe it was even a, a placement testing um, session, where a guy stood up, a man stood up, and basically started not yelling, but aggressively talking at me, saying that I had told him that the class would be gender segregated. Um, I mean, I was caught off guard by the tone, but I was quite certain that I'd never said that because our classes aren't gender segregated. Um, so I basically, I, I explained this to him and he said, um, he, he said, well, you know, this is not on, our classes need to be gender segregated, you need to respect our culture. And I honestly didn't know what to do. Um, I, I told him I would speak to our team, to the team, and so and get and basically get back to them. Um, so we spoke about it. We considered the possibility, but in the end, it really wasn't feasible. Um, we 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 made a decision, or we made uh, our position. We had to find our position, and then we organized the meeting with the community to explain it to them. Of course, we were willing to be convinced otherwise, but you know we had a, we had reasons for why this wasn't going to be possible. So we had this meeting with them. We explained to them that, look, we're a volunteer NGO. Uh, we rely on volunteers. We had very little resources back then. It wasn't feasible to have um, double the schedule because to split our four classes a day into you know gender segregated ones would double the schedule, would double the need for the teachers and the space. And we just didn't have control over those things. We were working with an organization who was managing that camp. So we said it wasn't feasible, and we also didn't see the educational value of splitting the classes. After all, one of the main reasons people were, work, were coming to learn a European language was so that they could integrate better. And it made no sense to separate classes by gender. It was actually counterproductive to integration, since in Europe, they would have to interact with both men and women in their daily lives. So. We told them this was our, our stance. They rejected it. They didn't, they weren't happy with it. And they said, okay, well then we won't come to the classes. And we said, fine, like you don't have to come to the classes if you don't want to. We're, we're offering you these classes and we have an amazing teacher who's been working at the British Council for the last 12 years. Um, so that is available to you, but the choice is yours if you want to come or not. And so a couple of days went by and the, the students showed up. They told us, look, we'll come, but we're going to separate ourselves in the classroom. And with women on one side, men on the other. We said, fine, that's totally your choice. You can sit wherever you want, as long as you know that this isn't imposed by us. So this might seem like a success, but what happened after is, is the real success. After some time, um, the ministry, the Greek ministry moved about 150 um, African refugees to Ayeleni. And like everyone else, they signed up, they came to class, they said hello, and they grabbed a seat. And what do you think happened? They sat wherever they wanted. So you had Josephine sat next to Mustafa from Yemen, asking him to hold her baby while she grabbed her notebook. You had Predi, this big Cameroonian guy, leaning over, you know, sat next to Alia from Syria, leaning over uh, to grab a pen from Leila. And <laughs> it was a really amazing moment because everyone, the old students had kind of froze, they kind of frozen, they weren't really sure what was going on. And they looked at me, looked at each other, and then just burst out laughing. And in the space of a second, all the tension that was there previously just melted away because it was obvious to people that, that the new students did not see the segregation. So yeah, this is, um, this is what I mean when I say don't expect people to act or think a certain way based on their nationality, gender, or background. If we had assumed that Syrians would never agree to this, we would have stopped this really amazing 
open-minded, inclusive group from forming. And we would have reduced our expectations of people, lowered them to preserve a stereotype. Um, so yeah, and then another, um, another common sort of bias that people have or think about refugees is that they are true traumatized, um, too, yeah, too traumatized for humor. There's no better way of saying it. Um, and sorry, just yeah, this is a seemingly small, um, uh, this seems like a seemingly small kind of, um, what's the word, thing to think about people, but it's extremely dehumanizing. And refugees have gone through a lot. They have had difficult experiences. They are living in a really stressful situation and dealing with a lot of uncertainty, but they haven't lost their humanity. We were having a, a beer one day, um, a colleague and myself, when we bumped into Marwan, or he bumped into us. He was in a really, really terrible mood. He had just been to the asylum office and he'd found out that his uh, first interview wasn't for another two years. That's two years in this. There should be a photo coming up. Now that's not his container. His container is the one next to him, but you can understand why he would be why he would be feeling down about having to spend time here um he was feeling super sorry for himself and he's a he's an emotional guy he's a melancholy guy if he doesn't get distracted from his um from his thoughts he'll dwell dwell on them all night so to lighten the mood a friend said or my teammate said um i guess all those prayers to allah didn't work yesterday <laughs> cracking Marwan up instantly. And we'd crack the same joke if it was any other friend. So why wouldn't we do it with Marwan? Because he's a refugee? You see, our approach aims for the mind, not the gut. We, ass we assume people are capable of having a conversation and that they're not taking time bombs who we have to walk on eggshells around. And why, but why is this important? Well, because the idea of a refugee being a victim comes from us. It's created by us. The victim doesn't want to be a victim. Um, I think Hassan Akkad, a refugee that some of you may have heard of, illustrates this point perfectly. He says, people always want to see you as symbols of pain, or there's a symbol of pain. For example, it bothered me that my friends wouldn't tell me to piss off if I was being irritating or whatever. <laughs> so people either pitied him or pigeonholed him or both. And by being treated that way, Hassan knew he wasn't being treated as a person. Just like I was influenced by the depictions in the media, these labels that we put on people can negatively influence how they see themselves. As Hassan said, he wants to be told if he's pissing you off. Refugees aren't idiots. They know that people have different opinions and it's important to, to have the converse, those conversations with people because it's in the discussion of those opinions that true uh, relationships are built. It's human interactions that helped us um, uh, that helped us spot how labels like refugee or victim can push people away and remind them that they're different from us every day. And at its core, our approach spots these types of internal biases and works to remove them so that we can treat refugees like we treat everyone else. In our programs, for example, these filters don't exist. There's rules that apply uh, that we apply to everyone equally. We don't lower our expectations because a person is uh, because of a person's context. Um, and fairness is a really important aspect in any kind of community engagement. It builds trust, and people will engage with what they trust. So anyone that joins us 
whether it's a new volunteer or a student, needs to agree with the rules and apply them consistently or suggest changes. And these rules are a constant conversation because people don't understand how making an exception undermines fairness, at least not initially. So if you break a rule, like coming to class late or after a certain time, you won't be allowed in. We've had to deal with a lot of anger, a lot of outbursts from new students, a lot of confusion from new volunteers on this. And it's, it's the other students who stand up and explain the rules to the new student. Sometimes people play the victim card also. And they try to do this to incite pity, to make an exception, to make, to make us make an exception in their favor. This card has worked for people before. But the more you cry, the more you yell, the more you get in some camps. But the minute an exception is made, accusations of favoritism and racism escalate, which destroy credibility and trust. And in community engagement, trust is really the most important currency you can have. So I'll, I'll wrap this up with a story about Zakia. Zakia is 13. She's from Afghanistan. She had three best friends here, Mahnaz, Fati, and Farzana. They were inseparable. One day we heard that they were all being relocated from Greece, except Zakia and her family. As usual, people were given really little notice. All three girls left in the space of a few weeks. Zakia was left all alone. And Zakia is a really smart girl. She's wise beyond her years. She, she's friendly, she's a quick learner, she speaks perfect English and Greek. I don't know who wouldn't want to be her friend, but teenagers are really mean. And being a foreigner in a place where everyone else is the same is difficult even under more normal circumstances. She was really struggling with making friends and the girls leaving left a really huge void in her life. And we, we wanted to help. We came up with a, we, we tell her that we needed her help for our scouts program. I mean, she spoke English, she spoke Farsi, she would be really helpful to the teacher. And we kept pushing, we kept asking for her help. Eventually she agreed and we thought we'd succeeded, that our plan had worked. Then we got this message from one of her teachers. I'll let you read it. Zakia couldn't be fooled, as you can see. She had understood everything. A few weeks later, we shared a picture on our social media it was of Zakia, um, and she was, it was of Zakia at Scouts, and she was flanked by three girls who clearly looked up to her. I don't know what you were like at 13, but I, if I had seen my best friend surrounded by new friends, I would have been jealous, and I would have thought that my best friend had replaced me, but not Farzana. This is the message she left on the picture. It says, I hope the girls around you know how kind, beautiful, funny you are. I did really miss you and the, and the other girls. Please show, show, show Zakia this comment, it says. If these are our new neighbors, we have a lot more to learn from them than to protect them from. Thank you all for listening. Um, now we can turn over to any questions that people might have. Dan, let me know if there are any questions in the chat. Ooh. 
Okay, so we have a question here. Okay, so one of the questions is, as you said, removing biases that are motivated by good intentions can be easier said than done. How do you ensure that all volunteers apply these beliefs firmly and consistently? Um, so thank you for that question. Um, we have a really, um, a really thorough recruitment process. So our, we have our all interviewers go through a, a particular system. And in these interviews, we already begin assessing the, the personality of the people who are, are coming to, to join our team. So it's not just about the skills you have, it's also about your, yeah, how you think about things. Um, so we have quite a low acceptance rate. And once people join the team, there is a training that they um, are put, there are put through basically that enables them to basically see, learn or not, not just learn, but like develop the skills that they need in order to be able to reflect on their own interactions with people and identify these biases themselves. So at the beginning, um, you will have, um, you, you would never go to camp alone, for example. You would have your buddies who would be there. All the work we do is always in teams. So a new person is, is unlikely or actually doesn't go to camp alone. Um, for the specific reason of building these reflective abilities in them so they could better um, engage with, with refugees. Um, and so, yeah, it's a pretty long uh, training. I'm not going to go into the details of it now, um, but the, the, through that training, the idea is that, or the results are that a person develops um, self-reflection techniques and um, through discussion realizes the, the biases that they have and then finds ways to basically address them. Mm, what else is there? Are you, are you still in contact with some of the refugees that you mentioned from Katika 2016? Um, yes, actually, we are um, in contact with well, at least like are in what the words not touch, but are connected to m pretty much everybody that we met in Katsika 2016. Um, like I said, the camp really became a community, and uh, an entire chat could be, you know, held <laughs> um, about the camp and how it how it turned into that community. So we were re we became really close to people like we we organically just built these relationships with people because there was no us and them we weren't they, they weren't the beneficiary we weren't the service provider um so we, there was there's facebook groups that are dedicated to the katsika's family and so we are connected to a lot of the people um but then of course like people like for us and people who are we're closer to we um you know we're, we're again closer with we have more frequent conversations with and uh, Faraz is currently in Sweden with his family, the rest of the construction team as well, um, except for Kafri and Noor, they're in Ireland. So yeah, we are in touch with people. We, we've stayed in touch with them. I mean, they're friends for life after that experience. What other questions are there? Um... Mm. What is the response of the refugee community to your approach? I mean, we positive <laughs> in the sense that it is because of our relationship with people that I think we survived um, as, a, as a grassroots NGO in that context. I mean, for people who aren't familiar with, with the situation in Greece, um, there was a crackdown, not crackdown, but a lot of, a lot of NGOs died. Um, a lot of NGOs were born out of this response and a lot of NGOs died. And we were, uh, we are small, we were small, we're grassroots. When the big NGOs came in, the chance of us being pushed out was, you know, there was a possibility, but we were such a, um, 
integral part of the communication channels between the big NGOs and the community that um, the, the, the kind of trust and bond that people had, that we had with people and vice versa was really, was really strong. And I think it was because of the fact that, yeah, we treated them like people, like we didn't lie to them. We didn't sugarcoat things. We didn't pretend like we would solve every problem. We were, we were straight, we were direct, we were honest and everything we ever did was with the, you know, with the component of fairness to it, even in moments where a person might think that you're being, you're not being nice to them. Um, because our friends who would also be coming to class would be under the same rules. Um, so yeah, people people really, um, I think, appreciated the approach, and that's that's uh, illustrated by our continued existence. Uh, do people in the camps find it difficult to adapt to this approach? Um, yes. Well, yeah. Let, at the beginning, yes, and probably. Uh, well, I'll speak in terms of the classroom. So in terms of our rules. So I think people are used to being able to play the victim card and being able to, uh, you know, to say, to cry, to scream, to tell you stories that will emotionally move you, but that we absolutely <laughs> don't allow. Um, Sorry, questions are coming at the side and it's distracting me. Um, so, yeah, so like in terms of like this, our strictness and in, and how we apply these rules, there was a lot of uh, growing pains um, internally within the team, uh, in, in, within the community. And it took a lot of investment, like hours and hours and hours, like countless hours of investment to explain these things to people, to get them to understand why they're there, to understand the value of them, um, to make changes. Like there were rules that we had made that maybe we didn't, hadn't factored in things that would affect people. So, you know, people in a camp have things that come up last minute, a, a legal appointment, a medical appointment, they cannot foresee that. So we had to make sure that the systems we have, that the rules we have uh, protect people um, or not protect people, <laughs> wrong, wrong word, but um, ensure that people aren't going to be missing out on things because of the mess that they're in. So yeah, there was a lot of learning that done both ways and people, it, most people had to get used to it, but in the end, um, they saw the value of it. Um, let's see what else. Have you seen other NGOs work in a similar way to you or that find your approach better? So yeah, I mean, there are NGOs that work in a similar way to us. And I think a lot of them or most of them are NGOs that or projects that started out in the same way as ours. So projects started by regular people who had certain skills, but who were not like indoctrinated humanitarians for want of a better word. Um, and who, you know, came came to respond uh, as humans. Like, I didn't go to respond as Dina, the programs manager at Qatar Foundation. I went as Dina. And that's basically the, what everyone did. And so the, 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 the organizations that formed out of that um, really had a similar approach. They saw refugees as equals, as people. It wasn't, you know, the beneficiary. So I think there are people who were very much influenced by that and who tried to take that um, organic kind of normal relationship building approach and apply it to their work. Um, however, I don't know, like it's not the same, if you know what I mean. Like it, it, people have their ways of adapting um, things that, to suit them. I mean, I think we are quite strict but as most people um might think because we are really like fairness is is our is our most valued sort of possession in this approach so um i haven't seen organizations apply that to it to the degree that we do but i mean it's possible that, that there are ones out there and we have heard from people um when we went to the islands um that 
they do really struggle with this component of community engagement because of the aspect of like favoritism and the accusations that come with it which can be really damaging for an NGO. So usually NGOs try to have a boundary between um, between their their staff and, and the community. But we, we believe that we found a way that protects us from that and that ensures that people are being treated equally, regardless of whether I'm friends with that person or not. There's something, uh, apologies, okay. Apologies, I missed the beginning. Is Katsik as a closed camp or in danger of becoming one? So at the time, in 2016, Katsikas was not a closed camp. I mean, there was nobody there. Like, there was no officials there. I mean, the military was there, but they weren't doing anything. Um, but now, again, it's not a closed camp in the sense of the ones that are being built at the moment, but it's closed because of corona restrictions like and also because of laws that are now coming into place about um act ngo activity in refugee camps um what is in danger of becoming one i'm really not sure um i haven't heard anything about it but um the way these decisions are made in greece sometimes is, is surprising so it's possible but hopefully not if one of my colleagues is listening and they have uh, other information, let me know and I'll I'll add it. Um, another question: Have refugees ever commented or spoken to you in any way on how different your approach is to most other NGOs? Yes, <laughs> um, I think it's quite obvious to people that uh, that that there is a difference and that and what that difference is. It's it's similar to. You know what the the quote of Hasanaka that I shared um, earlier. It's like people can feel that they're being treated differently. You know, these are capable people who have suddenly, who have lost their home and are suddenly being portrayed or dealt with or interacted with as if they can't do anything for themselves, as if they can't think, as if they can't act, as if they can't do the tasks that they have been doing their entire life up until that moment. So, and that is that is how humanitarianism functions i mean it does perpetuate dependencies this isn't something controversial so for sure they to, like it's obvious to people that um how different we are and it's i think also quite clear from the kind of relationships we have i mean we 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 go to people's houses for dinner you know or people's tents for dinner this is something that other NGOs would never um, do. Um, we tell people things straight up directly, like a person can spend six months on a waiting list for one of our classes. And this can be a, a really constant source of frustration for people. And they will see you in camp and they will call you over and they will demand that they, you know, you check when they'll be allowed in. And, you know, there's no, um, there's no sugarcoating the situation. Like, you're on this waiting list for six months and you'll be on it for six months. And if you're here, you'll have a space. And I think it's the honesty as well that they just appreciate and are like, you know, okay, great. I can deal with this information. Any other questions? Uh, there's one, uh, okay. Have you ever had any disagreements with other NGOs about your way of doing things? So, I mean, generally, no. Um, we're not doing anything like that. That that isn't you know good. Um, there are people. There are of course NGO. There are mindsets, and there are people who've had this experience or have worked in humanitarianism for a while who are in intrigued by it um, because I think that this issue of refugees being othered by uh, by pe by organizations by the community by the communities they're in is a, a problem that's kind of always been there um and i think there is intrigue and there has been there have been a lot of conversations around how we do it how we you know ensure that you know our code of conduct is, is respected by everyone that every volunteer knows what they're doing like that all the kind of safeguards are in place um but i wouldn't say that it's ever been a sort of disagreement uh, 
Okay, let me see if there's any more questions. No. Well, no, okay. So I think that's it. I don't see any more questions coming through. Um, thank you, thank you all for joining. Um, I hope that it was interesting. You can follow us and stay in touch with our um, with our activities. You can, you're welcome to get in touch if you have any ideas of how we could collaborate. If you want to volunteer, all that information you can find on our website, which is right there, um, secondtree.org. Um, you can also follow us on our social media channels and. Um, so yes, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, hopefully the end of these awkward online festivals is near. But um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, 